This is an interesting area. Uh, I work mainly with MINAS in, in, in the area of doing apisectomies and treatment of cysts. So uh, we'll go through a few cases and uh, just get the generalized idea of uh, how we're uh, approaching matters. Um, initially, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the original name. I, I know that at the office we brought this up, and the whole idea of ethos is, uh, as we, we know from Greek, is ethical bone. And uh, we just did a, a patient sort of related uh, video, and it, it was interesting because the lady who came in for the uh, to give to do the video, uh, actually was a vegan herself, and uh, she was quite amazed that uh, and didn't quite fully understand the, the ideas of um, donor materials, what was natural and what was synthetic, and so we described it on that video, which I think will be up soon on the Ethos site. So it, it's a good thing to get across because I think a lot of people don't realize uh, that they're vegan and then they think by saying they want something natural, they're in fact getting something that's uh, um, suitable for them. And uh, it's not a big area in my concern, really. My concern is more about the performance and the superior performance of these newer synthetics. And, uh, you know, this has gone on for 30 years. I've been placing implants and using only synthetics for now 21 years. Um, and uh, it, it has been a great uh, a reward for all of us at Ethos to uh, being presented this Queen's Award for Enterprise, and uh, we'll all be in London celebrating that on Thursday night. So it, it's uh, it takes a long time, and it's it's been a, a, a an interesting journey. But uh, we, you know, it's so good to be getting an award like this. And another thing I just wanted to talk about before is I, I always sort of show this about success of using bone grafting lies in the basics of good surgery and bone biology. And, you know, I, I had a long chat with a very prominent uh, periodontist in London who's now just about uh, solely using um, ethos after, after using many materials. And it did take him a bit of time, though, to understand. And this is the thing that I was talking to Dom about it as well, and, and that sometimes uh, people try something and it, they don't realize that it actually requires a different sort of a slightly different surgical approach and a different way of understanding what's actually happening. And that's exactly what he said. He had no idea that it actually required smaller flaps and the concept of uh, using smaller flaps to move keratinized tissue more from the the palatal to the buccal side. So it's when you go back and look, or if you look at any of the surgeries, always look at the small points closely, the suturing, the flap design. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit on that tonight as well. <clears throat> because, you know, whenever you hear someone saying that material did not make bone, um, you know, I've heard that with many different materials and it's not the materials making the bone it's the host and it's the host healing so it's important we look at that and keep that in in mind um so sort of cysts in the dental alveoli area this is what we're going to be talking about um there's there's many different types of cysts from odontogenic to radicular residual radicular cysts uh, detigerous cysts, eruption cysts, calcifying odontogenic cysts, um, lateral periosis. And so what we've got to do is try and assess what type of cyst it is. The vast majority of cysts we're going to see are going to be the radicular cysts and the resist residual cysts, which are radicular of origin. And, you know, this is going to be uh, our core of what we're going to show tonight, are these radicular and residual uh, radicular cysts because this is what we're generally seeing all the time. And, and often they, they're much bigger than you think. Um, I, I will show some odontogenic cysts so, uh, as well, cases. But, um, you know, what we got to look at is how to work with the host, how to help the body heal itself. This is the, the whole concept and the whole ethos of ethos is to try and reduce and minimize surgery. But why ethos? Well, as we've looked at in many uh, occasions before, the makeup of ethos, 65% beta TCP and 35 calcium sulfate. The beta TCP obviously stays around longer and the calcium sulfate 
is there as this shows in a list of benefits. It's biocompatible, stable. So it stabilizes the graft. It's bacteria static in nature. So this helps allow us to use it in effectively uh, infected sites. Um, but obviously a lot of care must be taken here because whatever you put in, infection can occur despite this bacteria static nature. So it's just that it doesn't really uh, take off the infection, but you can actually get uh, an, an infection in, in a site or adjacent to the site. Um, we see massively improved soft tissue healing. I've gone through that a, a lot. And also that it bioabsorbs at three to four weeks. What this bioabsorption does is it creates space for further neovascular ingrowth. So improved angiogenesis, as well as providing the nutrients for this mineralization that will occur later. And this is another really important aspect is that whenever we take CBCTs or x-rays, especially in the early phases, CBCTs only show mineralized tissue. So obviously, if we just put some mineralized tissue that's dead, it will show up really well. But actually, tissue that is a bone that is regenerating, especially in the early phases, will not be as um, mineralized and therefore not really as opaque. So it's not a very good way of actually assessing cases uh, using radiographs, but it's all we have. And so we, we have to use that. Um, I always show this case. Now, the, why am I showing this case in, uh, in with regards uh, cysts and apicectomies? Well, what I'm showing this for is to show the potential of the material to regenerate to host bone. And, and this is the main thing because I cannot think of any other material on the market that can do this and that helps the host do this. And so this is essentially the you know, ethos is party trick, if you want to call that. Um, I do this probably once a week, so it's not often I do it, and I use it as an emergency rather than I plan to do it. I don't set out to do it. I do it uh, when I've got a situation where we've got a big defect site, and um, I want to place the implant at the same time, but I can't get primary stability. So it is something that I, I do do relatively often, but about 400 now over seven years. And uh, yes, I've had failure. I had um, two failures now. Um, and one of them was an infection in the site, which I've shown before. And by just the implant being pushed out after four weeks, uh, it healed over and um, we've had a great result long-term over six years, five years. But the other failure was actually uh, a lady who used to work for me. And what happened is she's a heavy smoker and we just didn't get soft tissue healing over. And somehow it led to uh, a, a non-integration of the implant, which wasn't a problem. I asked her to stop smoking. She understood the situation. And, we, and when we opened the flap, the bone was good underneath. The new bone had regenerated. So we just placed the implant in. Anyway, I've shown this a lot of times, but this is not a protocol. This is just what you can do in an emergency situation by just placing the ethos directly into um, the site. Here's a four wall with a little buckle defect finish buckle wall. And we're going to just push the implant in with no primary or very low primary. You find that it actually you can get primary on the graft material, so that helps you angle it correctly. But as you can see, we've got no bone to implant contact and no primary or very low. And here it is at 10 weeks. You can see a nice regenerated new buckle plate, and you can see the bone turning over. We now need a round burr to remove this new bone. This is new bone, very early bone in function. It'll remodel and, uh, and mineralize further. But we've already got 77 R style, so that's more than enough to load the case. In fact, it's higher than I would see on the system in normal bone. And what we've done by doing this is we've managed to maintain nice soft tissues as well. And here it is loaded at four and a half years. So if we look at it, no bone to implant contact and low primary, 10 weeks, you can see it turning over to host bone, 12 weeks it's loaded and one and a half years. And here's just looking through a scan at it at 
one and a half years. So if we look at it here, this is two years loaded. And what we do notice, I'll discuss this in a minute, and here's the scan at two years loaded. You, you can see from that side, we've got, we've got now very high quality bone. Because at two years, all we can see is host bone. All of the graft material will have res resorbed by now. This is a well-known fact. There's hundreds of papers in high impact journals saying that porous beta TCP is always fully resorbed. Um, and here it is uh, loaded at three years. Uh, let's just go on to that. Now loaded at four years, what we've got is we've got a maintained nice stability of hard and soft tissue and five years loaded. This case is now six years loaded. Um, I, she came in to see the hygienist the other day, but I didn't get to see her. I was a bit busy. And, um, you know, hopefully she comes in and I'll get six, six and a half years loaded. The interesting thing here is the slight denser nature of the bone in the area. If you look at this closely, people often sort of say, is there graft material? Is there still some residual? No, there isn't residual graft material. It actually turns over to host bone, often in the shape of, of graft particles. And in other lectures that I've done, uh, I explain this and show this uh, routinely in, in macroscopic as well as uh, microscopic detail on looking at core samples. So this was just another, you know, quite a difficult uh, patient um, who was very demanding. She had the tooth taken out three weeks before and by her dentist and wanted to have the implant placed there and then. Now, obviously, yes, I could have placed a maxi in here. Probably not a bad idea. I must start using maxis by Southern. But uh, I, I know that I can get, you know, a very 99 percent plus success rate using this push in technique and so yes i just cleaned this granulation tissue here out with a little bit of care because this is quite a um still well developed cyst tissue a cyst side turn granulation with a ridiculous residual ridiculous cyst which we needed to remove with degranulation birds <coughs> i then placed the ethos in and i attached the cover screw to the implant in in the carrier and then just transfer it, push it into the site like you saw on the picture before. Here it is pushed into the wet to mix in the site. And then I just put some drier ethos over the top, pack the site, suture, close the PTFE. I like using um, Coroflon, which you can get from Swallow in the UK, which is from Poland. It's a nice PTF suture, PTFE suture. And here you can see this ridiculous cyst in this area, taking up this whole area here. Now, we need to remove that, but we also have to be cautious about obviously the, the nerve and damaging the nerve. So just always remember it's important to assess where the nerve is. Here we can see the top border of the nerve and the lower border. So it's important to assess that because this is the the six, and often this nerve can ride in varying positions according to different patients. And so it's important we, we do this to avoid. In um, 31 years of placing implants, I've actually, I've been lucky enough to never damage a inferior alveolar nerve. And yes, I want to keep it that way. It's important that I keep it that way. So here you can see, this is the site cleaned out. The pushed into the wet to mix, you can see the implant here. I think this is a 5.5 by 8.5. In hindsight, I should have used a 10, not an 8.5, but I like to get closure and coverage over the implant. But I think another, you know, one and a half millimeters vertical would have been a, a better idea. And here's the dryer mix over the top. Here it is a week later, and you can see the sutures of, uh, at taking the sutures out and you can see we've got nice closure. Now, when you're doing this technique, you must get nice closure. The only failure I've had, failure to integrate, was, as I said, in a heavy smoker and the site just didn't close for two, three weeks. And I think that's why we ended up with that failure in that, in that site. And as I say, fortunately, uh, I knew the patient, and B, I did really explain to the importance of uh, not smoking um, quite so much. But anyway, here, this case now, 
at 10 weeks. And you can see this is now turned over to new bone. And you can see that all the deeper material is turning over. So it's ready to load at 10 weeks. And I've raised a flap. And as you can see quite clearly, this is the new bone. So this is where the ethos was. And 10 weeks later, it's nice uh, host regenerated bone. So it's, um, it's important to have host regenerated bone, I think for the long term, and not just for the patient stability. We've got to remember that uh, bone is living tissue. So it's turning over all the time. As you know, we turn over our, our, our skeletons a number of time in our lives. And it's important that we don't have foreign material, which may impede this turnover and then lead to a sclerotic necrotic situation, as was published by Michael Norton in, uh, I think in Germany, I'm not sure which journal, but I think it was in Germany. And so, as you can see, we now need a rounder to access the implant. You can see the new bone as needs to be removed. And I've removed a little more, a little excess, because we're going to need to get a good emergence profile. Yes, uh, in hindsight, another a 10 millimeter implant would have been ideal, because as you can see now, it's important that maybe we had a little bit more, uh, a little bit more height here. And then I would have needed less of this pedestal uh, implant. Anyway, um, believe it or not, the, the, here's the crowns and the patient uh, felt these, this, especially the six was too wide and, and I just brought this in. So I had to do, re remake um, the crowns after about eight months or so, which was uh, a, you know, a little interesting. And these are just an X-ray of the remade ones, but you can see at, at loaded at eight, nine months, you can see we've got nice bone and nice solid situation and a good stability in the case. So this is the important part about when we're going to be dealing with cyst sites as well. It is a lot easier to deal with the bigger cyst by just putting in something like a xenograft, where the bigger the particles, you just throw a whole lot of particles in, or um, and basically it'll fill the hole easier. But it's far more, uh, I think, more important to have a regenerative approach, because as you can see in this uh, von Giesenstein slide by Harry Prasad, what it's important is, as you can see, the graph particles here are turning over to host bone. So we've got a high percentage of host bone. And all the research that I've shown on my other lectures show that, yes, we get a higher percentage and, and a reduced percentage of connective tissue. I think this is also why this, uh, you know, the when we look at the x-rays after a few years, it does look more dense. And I think that that it could be that there's a reduced connective tissue. I'm not sure how this would work out over a number of years, but as far as I can see, over the periods of time we're talking about that it seems to be, it does seem to look a little more dense in some cases, in other cases not. And that's the other really interesting factor is the very of host to host. Some people um, create a lot more bone. Some people you open up after 10 weeks and they've got a solid uh, connect, a solid cortical plate. And other people have got this kind of new, uh, you know, very new bone. Um, and so that it's important that uh, we, um, take into account that it's not just whether people are smokers or diabetics or they got cholesterol or vitamin D deficiencies. It's important to understand that everyone actually, we're all different. We have different physiology and different healing rates. So we'll look in the, at, at, a, at a, a residual, another or a sort of ridiculous cyst here, and you can see it's a, it's a reasonably sized cyst. And um, this is a two years later uh, loaded, um, looking at the regeneration of not just the buccal plate, but also this palatal area. Can you see the regeneration? So this is another sort of video case. So we'll go through it. And, um, uh, you know, this was a young girl. So it was important we got this right. She's 26. You know, sadly, she's in this position where she had a big... Uh, ridiculous cyst. And here is taking curating the cyst at the time. 
I like to curate the cyst out prior to healing. And then we can then, when we go in after uh, at the second attempt at placement of the implant, it's important that we really clean the res residual. Can you see the wall is bleeding bony site? We're cleaning all the residual cyst lining away as well, because this could also cause uh, a problem later on. Yes, I'm just going to place this by looking at it uh, rather than any guide. And it's important that it's in the optimal site. I'm going to graft palately first as well. You can see it's a slightly wetter mix palately. I know it's bleeding a lot, this case. And we're going to have low primary stability in this case. Again, sadly, you can see it's still moving even though we've got it in. Now, I know sometimes people struggle with a lot of bleeding, but you can see how much it's bleeding here. So when I put the graft on, I immediately, the nurse has put her suction down and she's going to use this sterile gauze and just hold it and put pressure on it for about five or six minutes even. And I'll just stretch my legs. I know this is just taking the photo. By the time I got the photo, it was a little bit um, bloody gorged again. But you can see we start off suturing at the papillae. And then at 11 weeks, I've restored it using a screw retained crown. And you can see we've already got the profile back and this profile is maintained long term. In this case, five years old, I'm desperately trying to trying to get her back in. Um, but it's um, it's quite difficult in London because a lot of cases are referred. Most probably 80, 90% of my cases are referred. And so it's always hard keeping a long term and especially uh, you know, when things are all successful and they're not having any problems and they're happy with this settings, you just don't hear from them again unless you try and get them back in. So it's really hard getting on to follow up. But on this case, this is the pre-op scan and you can see where this cyst was and you can see the defects on the palatal and the buccal plate. And here it is at six months and you can see we've uh, got nice host regenerated bone uh, even at six months. This probably will improve with time. So when we look at it, there it is pre-op, and you can see the size of where the cyst was, um, and even a, a slight defect on the palatal plate. Here it is loaded at um, six months loaded, and you can see how it's turned up. You can see the regeneration of the profile. I don't want the profile out here. I just want it in line with the site. Um, even with the implant placed where I placed it, it's probably still too palately placed, but you don't want to take that risk of not having this few millimeters of buckle bone over an implant that always helps us in the long term. <clears throat> and here it is two years. What we notice over from six months to two years is the turnover of the bone. Can you now see the new buckle plate that's formed here? And you can see more trabeculations and the change of the shape and the style of, of the bone. Um, so this is meaning that at six months, it was probably, you know, five to 10% residual beta TCP. Now it's all gone and we have the stability. And here it is uh, loaded at uh, two years. And, uh, you know, you can see we've got nice trabecular bone and a nice buckle plate over the top, and this is just in cross-section. So when we're looking at a, a, a case, another one referred to me, in fact, you know, they, as I said, about 80% of the cases are referred in. And um, a, as you can see, we've got a big, ridiculous cyst in the site. Um, it, the tooth had been removed again. Uh, a lot of the time, actually, the referring dentists like to take the tooth out themselves, um, unless there's a real problem. I, I, I really don't mind. Um, in this particular case, in hindsight, I probably should have kept papilla sparing here um, by keeping uh, the soft tissue over the papilla, therefore keeping the blood supply to this papilla area. I'll explain when I actually change the design a little bit this is about six, six years old this case now so you know i've been looking and and really working on flap design these are important things as i say flap design and suturing are the two keys to success um but as you can see when we've actually cleaned the site out now with degranulation you can still see some tissue down here and it's important to try and 
get all of this tissue out so you've got that nice clean uh, bleeding bone. In this particular case, there was a difficulty and I did shy away and that was cleaning up against this adjacent tooth, especially deep down. Um, I'll show you that on x-rays uh, later and it was important uh, and, and, and you can see how it heals as well, but this could be an area for problems in the future, you know, or not in the future, in the short term. So it's important that uh, uh, we get good cleaning when we're dealing with uh, cyst tissue. As you can see, again, same procedure, basically grafting the palatal side, placing the implant. You can see the, the implant deeper. In this particular case, I've only got two threads holding it in. And I often do this. And then you can see the dryer mix. This has come straight out of the syringe. Dryer mix, you can see how it's just packed up against the site. Now, this is the x-ray, and this was the area around here. I was a bit reluctant to really drill down here uh, with the degranulation burr. And also when I'm cleaning on the adjacent teeth, I try not to get too vigorous on, on, the, on the adjacent tooth because we feel that there's progenitor cells and this can help uh, for the regeneration of the PDL. So here's the, the implant placed. You can see all I've drilled is a little bit into this bit of bone here on the floor of the nose. And that's it. That's my primary stability is those few threads. <coughs> and you can see it grafted. Now, this is at 10 weeks. Now, it looks like we're losing the graft material. What we're losing is we're losing the calcium sulfate, which gives it a whiter look. Um, so when we've, we lost the calcium sulfate and we're getting further ingrowth, but what's actually happened is we've probably got collagen and bone forming here, but it just doesn't really show that well on x-rays. As I say, if you want a good x-ray, you find another animal, choose your animal, um, and, and put it in. Um, it gives you a great x-ray. Does it do anything? No, it's not doing anything besides giving us a good x-ray. So we've got to understand why x-rays are, how they're changing, and how to evaluate them. And here you can see, I think that was just before, this is at now at 10 weeks. And you can see it's turning over. You can see I'm taking an impression. And then this is loaded another two weeks later. And you can see how this bone is now mineralizing a little bit more. Um, and we can see the, the reformation of a PDL, even in this area where it was right up against the adjacent tooth. And here it is loaded. So it's an adequate outcome for the patient. <clears throat> And uh, the referring dentist was happy with that. And as we're going through the years, you can see how this area is now improving and how the density of the bone. So that's a very scratched uh, scan. Um, and this was at two years and you can see it's further improved. Here it is now loaded four years. And again, you can see we've got stability and We've got the, the stability of not just the papillae, which is important, but also this area here where we've, as you say, as you saw before, we've had significant hard and soft tissue loss. So it's important that we have the stability. And here again, you, you can see in these two x-rays, one slightly angled to show the more profile and this one more vertical to show the importance of maintenance of papillae. And after four years, <clears throat> you can see this area where we were worried about is now calcified and we have good bone stability. The case is now loaded, uh, you know, four and a half, five years, I'll get him in sometime. So when we're talking about um, ridiculous cysts, as we all know, often as we're taking it out, can you see the cyst is attached to the, the end of the root? And that's the ideal situation. And that's, that happens often because we then don't have to, everything is attached. It's less of a cleaning attitude, but sometimes we don't, and therefore they become residual cysts. And those often are very important to clean properly. As you can see in this particular, yes, we had a, a vertical fracture and this would be a cyst a sort of um, halfway down uh, the side due to this fracture as well. So it's important. Um, that if we can get the cyst out like this in it's fully enclosed in its sac, that's going to be the ideal situation. Um, this is just another similar case 
using the same procedure where, where we couldn't get all the cyst out. Um, and as you can see, it's quite an extensive radicular cyst. And it's important that when we go in, that we clean the site out where the cyst is. Can you see it looks innocuous here, but there's lots of issues. Now, the important thing here is in flap design. You can see I, I've got good bone up against the canine. Yeah, the crowns are not, this crown's very non-optimal. But as I say, most of my cases are referred. I can't do that porcelain from five to five on them. Um, but it's important because of this residual cyst to clean this out. Now, the other factor is we've lost the bone adjacent to the central. Can you see the bone here? So it's important that I don't do papilla sparing here, but I extend it to the adjacent papilla because we're gonna actually have to regenerate this site here to improve it, to improve our long-term papillae. Um, then looking at it, when we just cleaned our way in, now you can see this residual cyst in here and the tissue. And now it's really important to get this degranulation burr to clean that cyst area. Can you see how nice and clean it is? How good fresh bleeding bud. The only thing I was in two minds about, is this bone bridge thin enough or will we lose this bridge? And I've discussed this a lot in the past, uh, the importance of if we feel that the bone bridge is too thin, it's better to remove it and regenerate a new one than to lose it over the long term. So I was in real two minds about this, uh, but I decided to, to keep it at the time. And again, you can see just using these southern drills here. Yes, I cleaned this bit out here as well, obviously, you can see there. Um, and um, what we're trying to do is get a good angle. Now, by using coaxis, uh, implants by southern it'll help me because i can place this more politely and yet still uh, get screw retention so as you can see when i'm placing the implant she has a, a dct uh southern coaxis placed into the site um i don't mind placing into graph material but you mustn't pack it in very um densely otherwise you then put a lot of compression on it so it's better to in this particular case, I just grafted afterwards anyway and graft and made a very wet mix initially. But as you can see with the coaxis, we can have the implant extending more politely uh, as we go further up. And because of the coaxis, it allows us to maintain screw retainability. Here, can you see this coaxis? It's at 12 degrees and it'll allow me to have a screw retained. Yes, in hindsight, this is probably too thin. I probably should have removed that, but as you can see, we've grafted extensively around the implant with a wet mix, and then a drier mix over the top. And here it is. So you can see this is where the big cyst site was. You can see the graft material in here. There it is there. Can you see all of this white? And then this is the graft material over the top. And then suture closed with uh, PTFE. I, I like using Blue M just to help the healing. Yes, it'll all be gone in a, an hour or two or three, depending on the patient. Um, but I give them a tube and they can take home and place some on it. It's anecdotal, but we, we like the results we see by using it. Anyway, here it is 10 weeks later. And you can see we've got nice, healthy pink tissue. And this is important. Once we've got healthy pink tissue, uh, we know we're going to have a reasonable job underneath. Yes, the patient was using a removable denture. I, I prefer other options, but most of the time, as I say, my cases are referred cases and I get stuck with what the dentist's given them. And it tends to be because they're happy with it. And, um, and I don't really have problems because in this case, all I did was made a vertical incision here, used a round burst, a small vertical incision, pulled aside with a boozer and pulled the, the tissue buckley with a boozer and then just placed a healing cap after removing a little bit of bone with the round burr. So this is at 10 weeks. This is early new bone. And yes, I needed a round burr to just access it. And that was fine. So I put, just put a stock healing cap on. And this is the situation one week later taking the impression. So you can see we've 
already got an improved site and here it is loading yes there's a little bit of blanching with the screw retention um and i think that you know everything obviously will be fine later on um slightly i i'm going to be using more the ti uh stock abutments from southern rather than their standard abutments because i prefer to have a slightly more concave approach on here and even after i'd adjusted it that was the situation but anyway, you can see we've we've got good turnover and uh, there's been no problem. So this is how I got the case and this is uh, at loading. So I'll, I'll see it in the future. Here's looking at exactly the same thing, uh, more difficult situation. And again, this was removed by the, the patient's own dentist. You can see we've got another ridiculous cyst, residual cyst, and there's a residual cyst in here. And so it's important, but when they've taken the teeth out, they haven't been very gentle and kind on me and the patient. And you can see, obviously, just got some forceps on it and 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 got it out. Yes, it's not a bad idea that because it was probably quite a difficult extraction when you've got a long post like this and a, a filled tooth, you, you can always end up with a fracture broken and underneath. So I'm not being critical. Um, Maybe I should flaps to the next one here because on both sides, we've, you can see we've lost bone. And this is the area that's of importance. So we're just taking the granulation tissue out. And here you can see the importance of this residual cyst lining. Can you see the lining tissue here? And this is after I've already used a curette to take the most, the majority of the uh, residual cyst out. So it's important to get these degranulation burrs, the ethos degranulation burrs, and clean the site fully. And here you can see we've cleaned it now. It's hard to get a picture right inside, but you can see we've got a little buckle defect and, um, and this big residual cyst site. Here's a better picture showing how nice and clean it is now. And we've just using a, a standard um, burrs on this, this i'm going to be using a bioner implant from barcelona here some just some great friends david morales system uh with carlos and and the guys in barcelona and you know it's a very a very good surface it, it always gives me great results and again you can see i've just uh done the osteotomy when we place the same procedure i'm just showing you the bioner implant before i'm putting it in and I'm grafting into the graft into the site where the cyst was and the palatal site, placing the implant, as you can see, into a wet side. Yes, I just got suction to clean this out. It's best to try and avoid that, it may impede the fitment of your cover screw or healing cap. And here it is with a nice dry mix over the top. And this is the x ray showing the case. And here it is loaded. Um, at 10 weeks, it was loaded at 10 weeks, and, um, and you know, it's, 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 it's adequate. Um, I'm not sure whether I actually did this crown or that was done by the referring dentist, because I'm, I know, uh, I think I did this actually. Anyway, here it is three years later, and you can see, yes, we've now got a nice stability, a slight loss of uh, papilla here but not really much considering we had lost a lot of the bone around here. So it's important that we regenerated this bone and um, help the host because the, more, the, the, re the regeneration of the bone in this area is important to get this contact point as in, in Tano's research to get the regeneration of these papilla over the longer period of time. Yeah, as you can see, uh, a lot of staining, very poor oral hygiene, uh, but this is the real world, you know, I'm not going to show, um, I could clean it all up, get my hygienist to clean it all up, but it's important that I show you that, you know, these are, this is what's happening, because we know, all know, we all live in this area where we, where we have these situations occurring in poor oral hygiene. But um, the stability is fine, uh, maybe a bit of marginal loss from here, or maybe about the same. Um, but I think overall the case has been great and the patient's been really happy. And if we look, especially where the, the cyst site was and the nice stability, you can see 
the keratinized and the mucosal tissue, nice pink, nice and healthy. And there's the x-ray taken. Now you can see we've got this nice vertical on the adjacent teeth. And, and this is taken at three years. So looking at slightly bigger cysts, this is actually a ridiculous cyst as well, but it was a, a much bigger one. And uh, we, I did this with Mines. And, it, and it's important once we take it out, you can see this is the, uh, the removal. This adjacent um, second premolar was so mobile. Yeah, you look, you can see it's not being held by anything. But you can see, because you got the cyst out in a nice clean way, you can see how nice and clean the bony site is underneath. We're really debating removing this, but the lady who's a friend of mine said, no, she would prefer to keep it. So we've uh, just grafted into the site, sutured close. Hindsight probably should have grafted a little bit more, um, but it was a massive cyst, took like three cc's. So, and, and then she went away for a year uh, work-wise, but as you can see, we've got, got nice bony coverage around this tooth. Now it's completely stable. We've got nice filling in, in, the, in the cyst site. There was just this odd connective tissue ingrowth in this site here, which uh, I then removed with, uh, with uh, D. Grand Burr. But as you can see before and after, it's a, it's a good healing. And when we look at the x-rays, this, uh, um, this is one year post-op. This is, sorry, I put both the same ones on here. I copied it twice. I just did this now. Anyway, there was the pre-op where obviously the whole site and then ethos to about this level. Um, somehow I just messed it up. I did it now while I was doing. Anyway, as you can see, we just cleaned the site out. And um, here you can see with that, that granulation tissue as I cleaned it out, this is the osteotomy for the implant. And we're going to use a two PDS suture technique, uh, which I've shown before by drilling two holes. This is just to help support the tissue for further out building outside the envelope. And as you can see, I'm just using another uh, any ridge implant here, I think a 4.5. And you can see by using this PDS, we can actually get support so we can build a little bit more buckley to thicken the buccal bone up as well. And there it is with the ethos graft side. Um, this has been loaded two years now, and when we look at the CT scan, you can see this is where the cyst was. Now it's all healthy host bone, and you can see we've got a nice, reasonable buccal plate and nice palatal plate. So there's there's a, a really good uh, restored site in this, and there it is restored, you know, um, after two years. So looking at things, the last case for cysts, looking at uh, in a much bigger situation, this is a case Minas did on relation in, uh, in Athens. And you can see it's a, a pretty substantial. Yes, again, it was actually a ridiculous cyst. So this is the vast majority of our cysts. And you can see the importance of, once the cyst is removed, the importance of cleaning the residual cyst tissue away. Again, he used, uh, I think, four or five cc's of ethos, sutured closed, and Again, always histology, if you have any concern about it, it's important to know exactly what we have for the patient. And here it is scanned 18 months later, and you can see from the initial cyst to 18 months later, here it is again. This density again is possibly due, is, well, it's definitely due to the um, reduced connective tissue component of the new bone. And you can see the residuals, uh, the cyst site, and here it is 18 months scanned again before after nice new buckle plate can you see the new buckle plate yes this increased density due to reduced connective tissue just one by costa um i just put this in at the last minute because i, I it was quite an interesting case state costa did and you can see he's got this big cyst area and grafted it here it is six months post-op this is pre-op and six months post-op showing the new regeneration of the site. Just a case that Minas and I looked at the other day, he did it, I was gonna, I was placing another implant on this lady and she, sadly she didn't want an implant here. So that we, she just decided that she didn't want it and there was nothing we could do about it. But here is grafting this large cyst in this area and 
when we look at it, um, we had nice burn afterwards. It would be nice to be able to really restore this and with an implant, but there you go. The patient makes a decision. And here you can see the ridiculous cyst grafted. And here, six, 15 months later, you can see we've got nice uh, return bone and nice regeneration at the ridiculous cyst site. Uh, Octavian sent this, uh, posted this uh, big case up. And, you know, obviously, probably a doctogenic cyst around uh, in, in the area around these two, uh, this impacted eight and seven. He had to remove them both, grafted and grafted pretty close to the IDN. He had no issues with it. And here it is. Uh, I think this was four months later. And you can see we've got nice regeneration in this site. I'm sure this case has improved further. So we'll just look at apicectomies um, briefly. Um, the way apicectomies have worked, I've been doing them four years, uh, back, uh, back to the days when we used amalgam retrograde fillings. And, um, and you know, I'd always said to the patient, look, I can get you 60%, 70% success. But in the last five years, both Manasseh and I have been using ethos with it. And in actual fact, our success rate's gone up to 95, even 100% success. So we've been really excited about it because there's an area that we had slight debates. And I know that all the um, endodontists say, oh, you just leave the site like this and it'll heal. But why not put a, an osseoinductive bacteriostatic scaffold material that fully turns over to host bone in there? For me, it, it's, a, it's a logical situation of just helping the site regenerate itself, especially when it's this size, uh, rather than just leaving it to heal and we may get soft tissue and growth. So it's, um, you know, to me, it makes sense, but it's anecdotal because we haven't published it. But the interesting thing is our success rate has dramatically improved as well. Now, always the MTA, there's many different types of MTA always retrograde fill with MTA. And here is the site afterwards. And you can see we've got a nice healing over the site. Looking at an X-ray pre-op, there's the, the cyst area. This is cleaned out, grafted with ethos. Um, this is six months post-op, uh, sorry, six weeks post-op. You can see it sort of turning over seven months. This case is, uh, about two and a half years now, so it would be good to get it back in. But again, another referral case. This is a great friend of mine who we do get back in all the time. He was in the other day, uh, Gerard. And, uh, you know, he, he, you could probe all the way down the buckle area of this. And he just didn't want to have it out. I, I sort of suggested it would be a good idea. So Mines did a... Um, and an apicectomy again, you can see post-op one year, it looked like it was going to flare up, but here's three years and it's been really stable and he's had no problems. And, the, you know, when we look at it, it's the, the probing depths were good back again after going all the way down. But funnily enough, six years, five and a half years later, he's having little problems with it again. And we feel there may be a root fracture. So unfortunately, this one may... But do we, do we save a tooth for another five years? I, I've been doing more and more um, periodontics, more and more uh, regeneration of, of, of the patient's own teeth because, yes, we could just take everyone's teeth out, you know, and, uh, you know, because they'll be lost eventually. But I think maintaining and keeping teeth as long as we can, I think, is an important aspect. So this is why we're looking at doing this more and more uh, at the moment. Um, this was another interesting one because it was a, a slightly tricky one. Um, you know, this was referred to me and, uh, you know, it was a classic situation, place two implants. Now I'm going to place my second implant right next door to this, this area. So I mentioned to the patient, Ooh, you know, maybe while we're there, maybe we should do an apicectomy of the area and at least clear it out. And she said, oh, what was wrong? So I said, well, you know, we've got this little area of bacteria here. And she said, yes, but the root canal has just been done by the referring. And, you know, immediately you're on, uh, you, you, you think, oh, I shouldn't have even mentioned anything. But it's important to try and get it sorted out. 
And as you can see, by the time I've actually cleared the site out, you can see it's quite an extensive site. And again, you can see how we've really cleaned, got back to the bone. It's important to do that. And you can see how I've resected a fair amount of the root off. And here we can see where the, the GP is coming out. So it's important that we retrogradely fill this using MTA. And there it is. Can you see, we're just using MTA, filling the site with the MTA. And then just filling over with ethos again, because yes, it'll help in this situation to help regenerate the bone and stabilize the situation uh, here. And there it is with the drier mix, you can see the gauze to pack it over and the two implants were placed. And this is post-operatively, you can see the site. Then COVID hit, so I never saw the patient, nor did the referring dentist. They really were uh, with some vulnerable people in the house. And then I saw at the beginning of the year, there was a sort of a window when everything started. They had their, the, the vulnerable people had had their vaccination. So it came in and here it is, um, it, you know, many months later, and you can see how we've got a nice healed site and a nice stable site and patients had no problems so this case has been referred back and restored now I presume. Difficult ones are always on the lowest because not only is the bone a little more cortical you can see the thickness of the cortical bone but it's more difficult somehow to retrograde fill as you can see I've cut the roots off here uh, and we're just taking all the granulation with degranulation burrs again you can see we've got a nice clean site here and again I just use boom gel in the site just to try and improve the bacterial situation but it's so difficult to get an angle to have a look at the retrograde and you know it's it always is difficult but here you go again just with ethos boom gel here it is healed and here it is six months healed up and the patients fortunately had no issues Whereas on the uppers, yes, look at this beautiful view that you can get. You can see the tissue nicely cleaned by Minas, nicely trim the roots off, make the indentation to retrograde full with MTA, blue M gel into the site, MTA on the site, and then ethos, suture close, blue M gel on the outside. So we're sort of following this routine, and this is Maybe this routine we're following, maybe there's a number of factors, but we feel that the ethos is having a, a great improvement on it. Here's the site before, this is afterwards, and this is a year later, and you can see it's looking, it's looking stable. Sorry, that was, this is a year later, that was 12 weeks later, the one before. All right, so um, I'd like to let everyone go and enjoy the football. We'll take some questions. I'd like to thank all the dentists uh, in, that I've shown work here, especially Manas. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank everyone for watching. And uh, that's my email address if you want to contact me. This is ethos.dental, the site. And always join us on Facebook case studies. I'm just going to show, post a whole lot of cases later tonight after the football if I haven't had too many beers. And it's going to show um, basically. Uh, some nice six, seven, eight year follow ups. And this is important because people want to see what things look like over that period of time. And I've got some really nice cases to show. So thank you, everyone. I'm just going to look at the questions. And uh, since it'll be mostly interoral ligament local, uh, do you think the presence of local effects of properties? No, I don't think that the local effects. Um, I've I've seen you know I've done thousands and thousands now over the years and I've never seen uh, any issues. Um, and then if you're adding more local buckley, again, um, I I don't see a problem. Once you get closure, don't worry about it. If it's not fully set, it it remains quite stable. Um, the effect on setting is those place buckley. No, I think the local doesn't have an effect. And if you, you, you know, as I say, get once it's uh, sutured closed, uh, the stability you get is from uh, the particles interlinking. Uh, the the vertical regeneration, um, I I avoid uh, 
PRF. Uh, it's a little bit like mixing cement and cement. Um, I love PRF. I love what Joseph Shulkin's doing. He's one of the guys that makes the most sense in the world. Um, but it just somehow I, I feel I prefer to use it over the top to help with soft tissue healing. Um, no, we never use biomembranes. I haven't used membranes oh, for 21 years, 22 years, and about 7,000 grafts. Um, the body's healed perfectly without membranes uh, for thousands of years, billions of cases. It's only in dentistry that we use biomembranes. Uh, the periosteum is the absolute miracle. And by using membranes, we know from our research, it impedes host healing. So there is no evidence about soft tissue growing and there's many other areas uh, and reasons for that, stability of the graft, um, giant cell reaction in, 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 uh, in capsulization. So we don't feel that the soft tissue grows in uh, or not from the periosteum as far as we can see. Um, do you wash the bloom? No, just leave it. Let the patient. Oh, when we've actually put it into a surgical site. Yeah, we wash it out before we place in the ethos. Yeah, that's important. OK, thank you, Amin. And thank you, Melissa and everyone else that's uh, sent in uh, questions. I'll just see if there's any more uh, questions. And uh, otherwise, whoops, we've just got another one. Oh, Melissa, I mean, that must have been Amin. OK. Um, and thank you all for, for listening.